This video is about the use of punctuation marks in medieval Chinese manuscripts. The punctuation marks used in modern China are mostly borrowed from the West and have only been introduced in the 1920s. So what did they use before that? If you're interested, keep watching because this video introduces the punctuation marks used in medieval Chinese manuscripts. And before moving on, please hit the subscribe and like buttons to help the channel grow and to be notified when new videos come online. Before the 20th century, Chinese writing was largely without punctuation and readers parsed the text relying on grammatical and modal particles. Another important aid for reading was the often parallel structure of sentences and the organic symmetry and rhythm of the text. But even though most of the texts before the 20th century have no punctuation, this does not mean that punctuation marks were unknown in China. In fact, there is quite a range of them used in manuscripts, many of informal nature. So in this video, we're going to look at some of these. So if we look at the medieval period, and in this case, we're going to be looking at manuscripts ranging from about the 5th century AD through the 10th century. So within this range, if we look at a typical manuscript, for example, this scroll, then we can see that there is no punctuation. There is nothing to indicate here the beginning and end of sentences, questions or exclamations. The whole text continues seamlessly and the reader is supposed to parse the text based on the knowledge of grammar and cadence. This does not mean, however, that punctuation was never used. In fact, we have quite a number of examples where punctuation is applied, but somehow this is an issue that's not discussed in too much detail. One of the few examples of the discussion of punctuation marks is this passage from somebody called Chen Kui, largely from the 12th century. So he writes, When errors occur in characters, paint them over with orpiment. This is a dai called si huang in Chinese, and then write them anew. If there are interpolated characters, mark them with a circle of orpiment. If there are missing ones, insert them by the side of the text. Or if there is not enough space for comments by the side of the text, then use a red circle and write your note on the empty margin at the top or bottom of that line. When two characters are reversed, write the character yi between them. We can see that this description actually pertains only to correction marks. So the most common one is the very last one mentioned here, that is a mark that corrects reversed characters. So here we see an example. This is a Buddhist sutra, probably from the 9th and 10th centuries. And we can see that the word Sampao, so the three jewels, is accidentally written in reverse order as Pao San, which is obviously a mistake because the same term occurs elsewhere quite often. So for example, here, two lines to the right, we see the same term Sampao written correctly. So in this case, what the scribe did he added this check mark on the right side between the two characters. And this indicates that the two characters should be read in reverse order. Now, this mark does not look anything like the mark mentioned here, which is the character Yi. But on some other manuscripts, especially earlier ones, we see marks that are actually similar to the character Yi. So, for example, here we have a manuscript that is based on the calligraphies definitely earlier. We can see that this reversal mark looks actually quite different. Or here is another one correcting the common word yichie, everything. So even such simple and common words like everything can be mistakenly written with having the two characters reversed. And by adding this mark here, you can easily correct the mistake. And it's actually quite interesting that these manuscripts were not redone. So even though there was a mistake in them, it seems that the application of this correction mark fixed the problem. There was no need to recopy that sheet of paper. As you can see, all of these marks are added between the two characters, slightly on the right-hand side. Uh, there is a single mark. But in later period, by the Qing dynasty, this mark changes. Here we see an example from probably the 19th century, maybe even 20th century. This is one of the famous Xiapu Manichaean manuscripts. And we can see here that two characters are mistakenly reversed. And then you have this double mark applied, which essentially does the same thing. It reverses the two characters. So then people would read them in the correct order. 
Now, one of the other most common marks is the deletion mark. And quite often it is a mark that's added to the right hand side of the character in smaller script. And you can see what the mark looks like. A little bit it resembles the Chinese character Pu. There's a vertical line and then a small one to the right hand side of it. So in this case, the second character here, the character Yi, is redundant. It was copied by mistake or it was added by mistake by the copyist. But then he noticed the problem. And so he added this little deletion mark indicating that this character should not be read. So when people read this manuscript, they would read through it. And when they get to this point, they would see the deletion mark and simply not read the character in question. If they copied this manuscript, they would obviously copy it without adding the unwanted character and the deletion mark. So they would copy it the correct way. But nevertheless, having the mistake and the correction on the manuscript did not seem to be a problem. And perhaps that's why we see so many examples. And here are some other ways of marking deletion. On early manuscripts, we usually see three dots on the right hand side of the character. And here we can see that actually a longer string of characters was deleted. So the three dot deletion mark is added to each one of them. A variation to this comes from a few centuries later. And here we can see that these two characters, Cheng E, which have already been written here, were accidentally copied again. And so then later the copyist, or maybe somebody who checked the manuscript later, added these dots to the right hand side, indicating that these characters should not be read. Now, from a much later manuscript, probably from the 10th century, comes this example. And here, for some reason, it seems that we have five dots on the right hand side. But actually, by this time, it was usually this half cross deletion mark that was in use. And that's the one we saw on the previous page. And then finally, we also have this example where the unwanted character is marked in red. And it is actually quite likely that this red mark was applied not by the person who copied the manuscript, but by somebody else. So these two types of mistakes, that is writing two characters in a reverse order and adding redundant characters by accident, were the most common mistakes. And so these were the marks that were used to fix them. So these were the main correction marks used in the medieval period. But then there were also a series of other punctuation marks. For example, one of the most common ones was the repetition mark. And the repetition mark, basically, it's like the ditto mark. It indicated that a character did not have to be written again. Instead, you use this mark, which indicates that the previous character should be read again. So here we have the character Xin, firewood written twice. And it's actually quite interesting that the second instance of the word belongs to a different clause. So the text says it is like burning firewood and then there should be a comma. And then the next clause begins saying that if the firewood is exhausted and then something else happens. So even though these two words belong to different clauses and so according to modern usage, you would have a comma or a semicolon between them. It was equally possible to repeat them simply by adding this repetition mark. In the second example, we see a whole phrase repeated. So the phrase is shuo, which means undescribable. And so by adding the repetition mark after each character, we repeat the whole string. So we don't repeat each character separately, but we take these three characters as one set and then we repeat the entire set. So instead of reading it as pu pu ke ke shuo shuo, we read it as pu ke shuo, pu ke shuo. And then here on the right hand side is another example where the word nie pan, which means nirvana, is repeated. In this case, the repetition mark is added on the right hand side, simply as this slanted short stroke. And for the reader, it's obvious that these two characters form a phrase and they have to be repeated not character by character, but as a set. So again, instead of reading it as nie nie pan pan, you have to read it together as nie pan and then nie pan. Now, another very common mark is the segmentation mark. And it's just me calling them segmentation marks because we don't actually know the original term. So on the first example, we see how this mark is added 
usually after three or four characters. And I enhance them a little bit in Photoshop so they're stronger and you can see them better. And these are probably reader's marks. So they, these were not added by the person who copied the manuscript, but by the person who read the manuscript or maybe who studied the manuscripts. So maybe this engagement with the manuscript involved a little more than just simply reading it. By reading it, the person was also studying it, reading it very carefully. And as part of that process, they added these dots segmenting the text into meaningful chunks. And we know that classical Chinese is actually very structured, it's very rhythmic, and the four character unit is quite common. Now in this other example on the right hand side, we see a similar practice and uh, the dot differs slightly, but again, it's added on the right hand side. And it means that in terms of the meaning, this is how the reader parse the text. So he considered what comes before the mark as part of the previous section or previous chunk of text and what comes after it as part of the next one. The use of these marks, however, is not necessarily consistent. So sometimes they're used consistently, but that's actually quite rare. And more often they're applied here and there maybe to offer some help through more difficult parts, but not necessarily everywhere. A similar kind of mark is something we could call a section mark. So this provides not only division between sentences or parts of sentences or even phrases, but on a larger scale, kind of like our modern paragraph mark. So in this case, you see that this is actually done in red as this kind of hook. And then there are other marks as well. These are the marks we saw on the previous page, which divide smaller chunks of text. And these larger ones serve almost like modern paragraph marks. So they mark the beginning of a larger body of text. And once again, they're applied by the reader. Now in the second and third example, we see these marks as these circles. And I think it's obvious that these circles were added by the person who copied the text. They are not reader's mark, they are marks that the copyist used to create an order within the text, to mark sections of the text. So in this case it seems to mark the beginning of a quote from a scripture. And I don't remember the exact text in this manuscript, but it's probable that we have quotes from scriptures and after that we have a discussion pertaining to those quotes. So the both examples come from the same manuscript and we can see the same kind of circle marking sections. Now the fourth example here is an early manuscript, again probably from the 5th century, and we can see these check marks which are more symmetrical than the check marks used for correcting reversed characters. And these check marks are placed in the middle of the line after a small amount of space and they indicate different sections within the text. So much more commonly, the new section was written on a new line, and then the mark was applied on the top margin. But in this case, it's obvious that the copies did not want to waste paper, and so he did not leave the whole line empty, and it was sufficient for them to mark the new paragraph with a space followed by this mark. Now this kind of section mark actually also has a chronological dimension, because in early manuscripts, and this is one of the early manuscripts from Dunhuang, and it's a good example to show how in these early manuscripts, the new sections were marked with this dot, or sometimes the check mark that we saw on the previous page. And typically in these manuscripts, the top margin is relatively narrow. And then we have this section mark, which indicates that we're beginning a new section. And in this case, in particular, this is a new chapter within the text. So if you see on a Chinese scroll, a narrow top margin and a dot indicating a new section, then it's likely that this is a relatively early manuscript, that it comes from the fifth century AD or even before. And here are some more examples of this. Again, all of them are relatively early. And in some cases, you can see that the margin is very narrow. And the shape of this mark can be different. The point is that it's on the top margin. And even though this check mark here looks kind of like the reversal mark before, because of its position, there is no ambiguity regarding its meaning. Another really interesting mark is the so-called reverence mark, which are basically just spaces left in the manuscript. 
So technically it's not really a mark because it's just an empty space, but many scholars consider it a punctuation mark. So in the first example, the space occurs before the word Huangdi, that is emperor. And so you can see because the emperor is a person who commands respect, the copies left a space before the name. Now in the other example, which is a 10th century manuscript, we see the name Yuan Kung, which is a name of a master. So even though he's not an emperor, but because he's the master who is revered by his disciples, his name is marked with an empty space before it. And this practice actually continues well into the Ming and the Qing period. And we can also see it in printed texts and stone inscriptions. So here I wanted to show a section of the famous Nestorian stele from Xi'an. So this is a stele that was erected in 781 during the Tang Dynasty. And we see a number of empty spaces in the text. And these mark the names of emperors. Because the arrangement of the text is relatively consistent, we can see that the space left empty corresponds to about two characters. So here we have an empty space of two characters, followed by the name of Emperor Gaozong. And then if we move to the left, we can see the same phenomenon with the name of Emperor Daizong, and then later Emperor Suzong, and then Xuanzong, and then Daizong again. So these are all emperors of the Tang Dynasty, and their name is marked by this empty space. Modern scholars call them Jing Kong, that is, reverence space. So perhaps in English we can call them reverence marks. Now this is manuscript S2577 from the British Library. And it's really unique because it has a colophon in red. And this colophon explains how somebody added punctuation to this manuscript. And as you can see, there's punctuation in red, the exact same color in which the colophon is written. So it's quite clear that the person writing the colophon refers to these marks here. And the text is volume 8 of the Lotus Sutra. The colophon explains that this person added punctuation to the text for the sake of beginners who would be reading this. So he was not doing this for himself, but for others who would read it after him. And he did not mark every four characters because four characters usually represent the basic rhythm of classical Chinese. So instead of marking those, he marked only the parts that were trickier. And then another interesting thing he writes is that he also marked certain characters which have different readings. He used the dot to indicate the other reading. So when he did not mark the character, that meant that it was read with its usual meaning and pronunciation. And when he marked it with a dot, then it meant that the character should be read as that other, less common meaning and pronunciation. So here we can look at some concrete examples, and I zoomed in a little bit. So we can see that here, for example, in two cases, he marked the character le, which means happy or pleasure. In the first case, you can see that it's part of the word yu le, which means entertainment or amusement. And in the second bit, it's part of the word kuai le, which means basically happiness. Obviously, he considered this le as the other reading of the character, because the same character can be read as yue, meaning music. And we can see that on the previous line, we actually have an example of this very same character, which is not marked. It has this dot after it, which is a segmentation mark, so it separates two bits of the text. So it's like a comma between chunks of the text. But the character itself is not marked. So the character should be read in the meaning of music and pronounced as yue instead of le. If we read further, we can see that the character wei is marked with a dot because wei has two readings. It can be read as wei and wei. And then we also have the character xiang, which can be read as xiang and xiang again. So the dot is to indicate which meaning is appropriate in this place. This technique is called po yin, that is breaking the sound or splitting the pronunciation. It's described already quite early, around the beginning of the 7th century, by the famous lexicographer Lu Deming. 
he writes in one place, the character Wu, which means not or do not, is different from the character Mu used for one's parent. In books circulating among the general population, these are often confused, and readers always mark the character Mu with a red dot to show that it should be pronounced as Wu. This is wrong. So in this case, Lu Deming is actually criticizing this custom, mainly on the grounds that these two characters are completely different. So these two meanings do not constitute two readings of the same character, because the characters are different. They look similar when written in cursive, but in reality they're actually different characters, so there's no point in adding that dot. But because he criticized this, we also know that this custom was already common in his time. The punctuation marks introduced in this video represent only a fraction of the marks used in medieval China. There are very few texts talking about them, but on the whole the manuscripts give evidence to how widely and consistently these marks were used. And even though the majority of the modern punctuation marks come from the West, some of the native Chinese marks continue to be used to this day. Okay, I hope this video was useful. Thank you for watching and see you next time.